I've been thinking long and hard about a Crusader Kings 3 series so very long and hard. I needed something that would captivate the hearts and minds of the people. Something original. Something never before seen. So I've decided we're going to restore Rome. Please, oh, don't, don't turn off. Please don't turn off. I know. Okay. Just bear with me here. Please, my analytics can't take it. We're not just going to restore Rome. We're gonna restore Rome with a very stupid gimmick. Welcome, my friends, to Crusader Kings 3. The Keys to Rome. And why is it called The Keys to Rome? Well, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> Excellent. It's a very simple series. I have installed every mod on the Steam Workshop that even is so much related to Rome. Every child of our dynasty, every person we can name, I will name in a Roman fashion using these here keyboard keys. And then every single time we or one of our children dies, a key gets plucked from a random list of keys. We use some online key plucker, random list picker. You know how it is. And if you're thinking, that sounds disgusting. We're going to see all the, all the scum that's under there. All of the YouTube commenters and the Hearts of Iron players. You're wrong. You're wrong. I've cleaned this keyboard about three or four times today. And it's not my keyboard. It's my girlfriend's keyboard. Uh, I wouldn't do this shit to my own keyboard. Come on, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and the point to the keyboard, of course, is this extra difficulty in a very meta almost biblical sense. The more characters that we lose, the harder things become to control for us. Not to mention the fact by the time we finish this campaign, our Roman Emperor might end up being called Goo. So without further ado, it's time to Crusader Kings 3. <laughs> now you're probably wondering, where out in this world could our character be? We perhaps are lowly lords somewhere within the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire. A Roman of Rome from the heartlands of Italy. Or maybe a lord from the not-so-holy Roman Empire. Now, we're, we're actually in Bulgaria. Let me introduce you, my friends, to Maximus Typinius. Count of this here random province in Bulgaria. And more importantly, a man who claims to be the last Roman. But Maximus... Has a terrible secret. He's not, he's not actually Roman. I mean, it's not a terrible secret given the, given the, yeah, he's not actually Roman. He's, uh, he's a, he's like a weeb. He's a, he's a Roma boo. He's read about Rome, perhaps, in a few books from Byzantium. And he likes to think he's Roman, but he's not actually Roman. Not really much of a secret, is it? It's just, <laughs> it's just common sense. That is my genius idea. A man with no relation to Rome who thinks he's Roman and pretends to be Roman is going to weasel his way into the Byzantine Empire and I'm going to pull keys off my keyboard and pretend that it's tangentially related. I've really outdone myself with this one. <laughs> in his youth, Maximus was a warrior in the Bulgarian armies and that's how he ended up getting this county or something like that. Though only a tough soldier and an inspiring blade master, he has a total of 19 martial naturally skilled shall we say but at the ripe old age of 25 <laughs> it's time for maximus to retire the first thing any good roman patriarch needs is an heir to continue on his very roman legacy well in hindsight i suppose he probably does need a wife first that's generally well as far as i know that's how these things work of course i wouldn't know i play video games all day what is this there are roman women out there in the world Ah, this one is lustful. Her name is Maximiana. How can I not marry her? My lady, my lady, perhaps you would like to see what else is Maximus. Why is he so massive compared to her? What the hell? <laughs> he really is huge. The man's like an ogre. The ogre of Bulgaria and his wife, the now Countess Maximiana, have gotten married. Now we can celebrate by taking money from the poor and needy. <laughs> we do need to pick a lifestyle because idle hands are the devil's playthings. I'm not going to kink shame the devil. I think Maximus has ideas much beyond his station. We're going to go for majesty focus with the aim of becoming August. I couldn't think of a more appropriate perk for a Roma boo. And Maximus does have three perks already from his, from his youth as a warrior. 
We're going to go for the gallantry here. We're going to go into courtship and promising prospects for our close family so that you can start becoming more of a noble house. Oh my god, war were declared already. King Boris is being attacked by Prince Vladimir Rosate with the fanciest hat I've ever seen. And of course, we're going to take any opportunity we can to prove ourselves in war. We haven't even made out the capital and we have a moral choice. Now, Maximus is a diligent, brave, and content man. You might think he is ambitious, trying to become August, trying to emulate that Roman lifestyle. But you've got to remember, this man is from nothing, from, from a lowborn family. He's worked his way up through the ranks, through military and martial prowess, and gained himself two counties. He might want to emulate Rome of old, but he's more than happy with what he's already got in life. I'm traveling in a less populated and more rugged part of my realm, and my entourage and I come across a number of corpses, and the stench of decaying flesh is noticeable to everyone. Judged by the armor and clothing on the bodies, as well as the wounds on them, it seems they may have been the scene of a recent battle between rival bandit gangs that infest this region. He is diligent. I believe he would properly dispose of the bodies, lest they rise as vengeful spirits. We have a potential battle already to impress our liege. The chances are even. They're defending a river crossing, they're high quality troops, but our army is led by the mighty Maximus himself. Now, he has close combat specialist trait. Skirmishers, damage and toughness both up by 20%. Not to mention the fact that he is a gigantic man. A truly gigantic man. Battlefield combat. Prepare to fight. Through blood and honor, you seize the chance to face up against Theodore. Serving under Costin's command. After a brief look around, you do not spot any immediate threat which could disturb the upcoming duel. Only one can prevail. Theodore has a total of 10 prowess. Maximus has 21. I think this is an easy fight. 67% chance of success. We have, we have immediately failed and been defeated. A humbling day for Maximus. <laughs> God damn you, Paradox. But he returns, battered, broken, beaten, and humiliated, only to find that his wife, Countess Maximiana, is bearing his child. I cannot wait to hold the babe in what's left of my arms. <laughs> Maybe as a way to stamp out his bravery and encourage a bit more diligent rulership out of this new ruler, our liege is offering us a position on the council as marshal. I just think you might not want any more embarrassing defeats. <laughs> and some say from that day onwards, Maximus never fought in an army again, turning it over to Dragos, his Praetor and Centurion. And also because, well, I don't want him to die before we've got a dynasty, to be completely honest with you. Maximus, what have you done? He's shown himself as a weak ruler, a weak leader, shirking on his court duties to get out there and fight as he did in his youth. And now, a challenge from Kaester Iansu. We can mock him. We can be ignorant towards him. We can blame him for all of our problems, or we can scream at him. Ah, the four pillars of the YouTube comment section. Now, from his days in command, Maximus developed some pretty proficient diplomacy skills there. It helps him bag these counties that he's now the ruler of. So this is a fairly simple challenge, I think, for, for Maximus. Let's mock his bothersome nature. There's a chance we get a weak hook out of this on Iansu. Ah... My constant snide comments have broken him down. The comment section tactics do work. Ah, a successor of our legacy. A new son to rule the dynasty. Uh, there's something wrong with this son. Flavia. What name would befit such a mighty lady? I'm going to call you Maximini. And who better to educate our daughter in the ways of Rome than this Bulgarian weeaboo? <laughs> As our first decree as ruler of these fine lands, we shall be renaming these non-Roman settlements to sufficient Roman names. The Capital County, Maximus Minor, and New Senate as the Capital Building, and then Maximus Minor Minor as the small neighborhood next door, because I was completely uninspired. <laughs> I think Maximus's first long-term goal for himself and his dynasty, Maximus Major, by gaining the Duchy, Mantinia. Or as it will soon be known, Maximus Major. Ah, oh, they all pale in comparison to Maximus. 326 men. 496 men. 726 men. Okay, well, that one's a little more. That one's a little more powerful. Let's, <laughs> let's take that slowly. 
After a couple of months here at court, we've got ourselves our first diplomacy lifestyle perk. I'm thinking maybe a little benevolent intent to try and help us climb the social ladder a bit. And on the subject of climbing the social ladder, our court chaplain Marinus has been sent over to this hovel over here to try and fabricate a claim. Well, if it isn't Prince Dox of Bulgaria, I've heard all about you. Who is this guy? Oh, a fellow August, I see. Fine. We will start exchanging letters with Docs. This is a great opportunity to flex our diplomacy skills. I thank you for your swift response. I'm looking forward to our correspondence. Please, I implore you, pick the first subject for us to discuss. While I do have some excellent war stories to share. To the fretful Count Maximus! Oh god, are you trying to make me feel like an idiot? Your last letter was full of obscura. I could not follow one sentence in three. And to think I used to value your friendship. Oh. Shit. Another blunder from Maximus. Is there no hope? Oh, and our summer house is being looted. Oh, Bereg Stratioti. I think that's incredibly unfair that our moron lead should declare war on the king and now our summer home gets burnt down. We've just celebrated our daughter's third birthday and that means she's ready to enter the world of work. I think we'll probably put her in the diplomacy sector. That way she can handle all of our correspondence and letters. Because God knows she would do a much better job than we have so far. And right on cue, a way for our daughter to get a little bit of practice in. We will start exchanging letters with Cubbard. Cud, Cud, Cudbard. He is a patient man, a paranoid and vengeful diplomat. My daughter, pen a letter to Cubbard about core alliances. Greetings, Count Maximus of Maximus Minor, to think you would know about a subject so dear to me. You truly know me better than most, since you've indulged me so. Might I ask, is there anything I can do for you? My three-year-old daughter wrote a better letter than I did. Perhaps we could arrange a trade deal. Or we could try and convince him that he owes us. He seems a lot more impressive than he is. 756 men, despite the fact that he's a duke. I think for now, we'll accept that we've Potentially got something good out of this. A nice little bit of experience there. I only wish to continue exchanging letters. And our correspondent teaches us a lot about foreign affairs. My god. This poor postman. Greetings, Count Maximus. I've heard good things about you. Oh, it's Docs again. Daughter, you, you can handle this one. A gregarious, brave, just, grey eminence, and august. I think he would prefer to talk about the blessings of family. Oh... And our court chaplain Marinus has gained a claim on the whole of Mutania. We can just about afford it as well. Excellent. Oh, she's done it again. This damn child, she's making us out to be a fool. Another 300 diplomacy lifestyle experience. Wowee. I think we'll go for... Um, well, that's pretty terrible, to be honest. How can I ignore the potential to unlock the Praetorian Guard. Oh, the Praetorian Guard, you say? We have a decision available. I feel like this is a gamble. Asparuk carries the title of Duke, as if it is unquestionably his, as if it is not skill and strength alone that should decide our leader. I, Count Maximus of Maximus Minor, husband to a living wife and father to a, well, also living daughter, question his right to the title, to all of Mutania, and I'll be silent no longer. I'm absolutely sure that this will not backfire in the least. We will challenge the Duke. So you challenge my right to rule. You better be able to back your words up with steel, boy. My liege, Duke Asperuk, hefts his sword and takes a step towards me. The whole tribe gathers around us. Excitement and fear heavy in the air as I widen my stance and I raise my hands and laugh awkwardly. <laughs> no. If anybody was born for this, it's Count Maximus and Maximus Minor, the 19 Marshal 23 Prowess Close Combat Specialist. Raise your mace. A non-lethal single combat will commence immediately. Yes! For a few brief moments, Duke Asparuk and I pace in lazy half circles, each watching for an opening. I lift my mace ready to defend myself while he clutches his sword firmly to hand. This fight may only be till first blood, but it doesn't ease my nerves. With a sudden twitch, our bout begins. Asparuk wastes no time meeting me with an intense series of powerful clues that force me back step by step. We can go for the suspiciously shonen protagonist sounding lightning assault, which I assume we scream as we do it. We can tire our opponent or we can blade dance. Generally, this is the right one given that it's highlighted. It gives us a bunch of prestige and it's the highest increase 
to our likelihood of success with the lowest risk of injury. And to be honest, poor Maximus has already had his ass handed to him enough for one day. I'm the fastest blade in Maximus Minor. In battle, I'm an artist. Every strike is a brushstroke. Every fallen foe or gout of blood, a splash of paint. As I brandish my mace, switching seamlessly between flourish and strike, I paint a picture of agony across my foe. My god, it's like a MySpace profile. Whilst our form is good with only small errors, Asparuk's form is formidable. Better men than you have died trying to break my guard. We're going to go for the riskier expert onslaught. Ah! Commanding the unwashed is a slightly different art to commanding those of higher birth. But the tools it's given me prove effective nonetheless. As I thunder out insults and threats at the top of my lungs, Asparuk is taken completely by surprise when I switch from thunderous bawling to crushing thwack, jumping backwards in reflexive fear. Instinct is fast, but it lacks finesse, and my foe shows this by dropping his sword as he springs away. I'm already midway through the killing blow when Asparuk hastily yields. I am victorious. Incredible. I win single combat against Asparuk due to sudden death. I assume you mean that in the metaphorical sense of battle, not in... <laughs> not that he, you know, got a brain aneurysm and died. More importantly, we are now a mighty Duke. Duke Maximus of Mutania. We've just made an enemy for life. And with that, Maximus's confidence is restored in full after that crushing defeat, fighting on behalf of someone else. All he had to do was fight his own battles. Now let's do a bit of sensible realm consolidation. Even Maximus is smart enough to know that the first thing we need to do is start to consolidate all the provinces from our new duchy title. No! To my vassal, I've come to the conclusion that you cannot be entrusted with the dignity and responsibility of the Duchy of Mutinia. I therefore request you relinquish this title forthwith because he considers Romans evil. He can revoke our title without being viewed as a tyrant. We don't really have a choice here. 2000... 996 men. Maybe we could secure some allies very, very fast. Okay. Okay, that works. The Duke of Thessalonica. It's not huge, but between us, we could maybe put up a slight fight. To the amicable Maximus, I gladly accept your betrothal proposition. 49 days to try and weasel our way out of this. With our ally, 1951 men. Still doesn't bring us anywhere near. Mm, divorce wife. Goodbye, wife. Marry. W one year old? Oh, no. <laughs> Morality aside, Maximus would gain an alliance with Duke Theodoristos and his 1,600 men. That might be enough. To the amicable Maximus, I gladly accept your betrothal proposition. Thank you. I look forward to meeting my wife in another... 16 years. We can make regiments with prestige. My god. A Roman tragedy to my oppressing ex-husband. I'm writing to inform you that I am with child and it's most certainly yours. Since we were married when this child was conceived, there is no stain of bastardy. When the babe is born, they will be known as your legitimate offspring. Okay then. What have you done, Maximus? You've betrayed your very Dynasty for power. Let's get the marshal marshalling. We'll get Maximus maximizing. And then with the last 15 days, we create ourselves an independence faction. <laughs> and we hope that they're willing to join us. Okay. Here we go. Raise the armies. Call the allies. And then head for the capital. Take the king prisoner, accept our independence, and swear fealty to Byzantium? Could it be that simple? My god, the allies are actually here already. Oh, Maximiana has given birth to our daughter. We don't get to name her. Armenia wouldn't have been my first choice, personally, but there we are. We've done it now. Wow, this is, this is working. Oh, <gasps> Boris. No, I thought he was going to surrender, but instead he's offering to educate my daughter? Now is not the time. Wait a second. France? He's allied to the bloody French? No, he's not allied to the French. Why are the French here? Oh, good God, that's a lot of French. We could have won it if not for them. Maybe we can just find an amicable peace. Even with our 
Byzantine allies, this is not... This is not going to work. All because of the bloody French. I will give you Maximus Minor Minor. Oh my god, that's done if they want to have 101. <laughs> and we will agree to be humiliated. Oh, he's well up to be humiliated. Well, up for us to be humiliated, that is. If we give him the gold and take the humiliation, we're only a couple of points off of... We're only a couple of points off of potentially also keeping our county. Look, if we marry our daughter to one of his distant relatives, we can ensure peace. That would be incredible. So in conclusion, to guarantee a white peace, our second born daughter, who we banished from our realm, has to marry a prince of Bulgaria. We're going to send him 72 gold and our dynasty is going to lose a level of fame before we've even started. This is a necessary evil. We will gain a truce out of this. To my vile vassal, may wisdom ever elude you. I accept your offer of peace and maybe put this conflict behind us. So be it. So be it. House Typinius, level of splendor, base origins. Oh, God. We've managed to go from nothing to less than nothing. Well, I mean, if you ignore the fact that we're a duke now with a five-year lasting peace with our liege, free to expand at our own whims. But besides that, this couldn't be going any worse. There, there, Maximus. Don't cry. Don't cry. Look at, look at everything you've achieved in this small time. We've got ourselves a very fancy duchy of which we have the fifth of. Your legacy is assured with children. I mean, they're terrible and we had to betroth them off to complete randomers. Not to mention your newly betrothed wife is two years old. But at least... House Typinius can stand proud as even less than nothing. Okay, okay, fine. The real silver lining to everything is that no one's died yet, and we've still got a complete suite of keys for what it's for what it's worth. <laughs> Except for that one that's just fallen off. It's just just fallen off. Will Maximus the Bulgarian Romabu reclaim his dynasty's splendor? Will he finally get that son and heir that he needs to inherit his duchy? And will he ever stop fucking crying? All that and more on the next episode of Keys to Rome. And stay tuned after the credits where I'll probably talk about some of the mods that we've got enabled because this has been a horribly confusing experience for probably the both of us. And as always, at least for my channel, a big thank you goes out to the patrons without which I would not be able to produce all of the many episodes across the three different channels that I produce on a daily basis. A big thank you today goes out to Andrew DeGaron, Kish, Udrick, Bubka, Ah, 9471, Slickback, Eckle Cakes, Kegbit Ure, Dante Mordecane, Londart, Dunker, My Name Isn't Dio, Biv, Asana Kirito, and Major Mythical for their support. The executive producer tiers over on Patreon. A big thank you to you guys for making the channel possible. If any of you would like to submit a name for a Crusader Kings 3 house, of course, send them over to me and I'll get you some, some landed characters to contend with, to fight with, or maybe to love. Thank you as well to Avolka, Adam S, Logical Builder, K Shop, Rubicon, Francesco R, Redeemer five zero two eight eight, Marcus Absent, Red Noah, Wifty, Captain Cuba, Hadgim, Lady Cerulean, Quagasol, and J one nine three as well. Now I'll talk about some of the mods in in its much of a capacity as I can remember them. So let's talk about some of the mods that we've actually got going on in this series. Then I want to save this for the end just because I didn't want to put off people who are just into the, 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 the narrative, the Crusader Kings gripping gameplay that we've had going on today. So the biggest one, and of course the one that is going to be most thematically appropriate for this playthrough is TCOP Rome Invicta, which is a massive mod aimed at fleshing out. It's kind of an alternate history mod that overhauls the Byzantine Emperor and turns it into the Eastern Roman Empire. The thing that really drew this in for me was the was the religion, the Pantheum Maioris Romanus there, which adds in a bunch of mechanics for that and kind of fleshes out Hellenic from the build your own religion base game CK3 religion into this this more kind of unified thing. And it turns, like I said, uh, Byzantium there into a more Roman themed empire. How uh, Julio Claudio with the SPQR logo there and Pontifex Maximus being the uh, 
being the emperor's title there rather than uh, Basilius. I believe they're also the head of the religion as a result. Yeah, there you go. Pontifex Maximus Romulus there as the leader of the Collegium Pontificum. This also adds a bunch of other decision mechanics that you might have seen popping up in the side menu there. So preview worth of the Praetorian Guard, for example. Generally, those would be things that we come across more as we slowly integrate ourselves into the ERE and eventually aim to form the, the, the full-on Roman Empire. Another large mod that you may have noticed here, but we haven't actually done much with quite yet, is the artifact module from uh, Way of Kings, our one of our last CK3 series that we played was, of course, the, the Way of Kings playthrough. And they've made the uh, the artifact module from that standalone to allow, you know, people to use it until we get a, a, a maybe Paradox uh, artifact system. I believe they've talked about that in the next DLC at this point, right? Oh, no, I'm in so much trouble. This mod is great because it allows us to keep track of and eventually craft our own artifacts when we go through the Antifabrial tree in the Perk Trees. But we can press this button here, the Artifact Owners, and I believe it's also on the map modes. And we can see as we kind of pan around here, any characters that have artifacts. There aren't many right now, of course, because there aren't... Well, there aren't going to be many artifacts in the base game. Iron Crown of Lombardy there for uh, King Louis the Younger. If we go over to, say, um, Byzantium or the Eastern Roman Empire, we've got the Imperial Diet in there. So it, it's, it's a way of keeping track of that. But as we craft it and gift them out, it'll be kind of interesting to see where those end up. But more importantly, adds personally one of my favorite systems from Crusader Kings 2 back into the game. Now, it's worth mentioning we do also have a mod called Ro Romai Oi? Romoi? What, that that one, the uh, Byzantine Empire mod on the uh, Steam Workshop. And of course, all the links to these will be available down in the description. Now, this one is intended as an overhaul for the Byzantine Empire, whereas, of course, we do have the Eastern Roman Empire in our game right now. I was told that they are compatible with a bit of uh, console commanding, a little bit of behind-the-scenes work to make them work. I haven't bothered doing that quite yet, because who knows if we'll even get up to the point of uh, Eastern Roman Empire. Hey, we might end up going in a completely separate direction. Essentially, it adds a very fleshed out and more Roman government type where you get senators, uh, themes, that type of thing. Um, you can go for imperial election, adoptions, co-emperors, all that type of thing with this imperial autocracy government type. Now, right now in game, the, the Eastern Roman Empire is a feudal empire, but I can flip that over, like I said, behind the scenes to get access to the best of both worlds introduced by both of these mods, which I think will be our kind of comprehensive Rome experience. Now we have another fairly large mod called Silk Road, which was actually working for a brief time when I was doing the testing, but something's updated between me testing this mod pack yesterday and actually recording it today, and it's it's disabled it. If I had to guess, it might be the, the artifact module, um, as it adds its own map mode type, might have replaced that particular interface widget with it, with its own there, um, but maybe a little bit load order shuffling, shuffling can fix that, but essentially it adds back the trade routes from CK2 again, trying to, trying to reclaim as many features as possible from that. For the time being, it's fairly irrelevant for us, particularly as it looks as if it may have been overwritten by another mod for the time being. If I can get that one working again, though, that'd be pretty massive, because, of course, we're going to be right on the Silk Road. Then a couple that we've seen in the background, but haven't really interacted with yet, City of Wonders for the Metropolises, which I believe should be in uh, Constantinople being the Metropolis holding. We have actually have done a series where we played as a quote-unquote republic in Venice with the Metropolises, which I, I would highly recommend going and have a look at if you want to see how that mod works in greater detail. Essentially, you get to build this huge city of wonders. There's one in, say, um, Rome and France and Spain, and, and everywhere where you would kind of expect to see a, a metropolis holding a, a huge city. The Night Manager would have popped up very, very briefly when I was uh, when we were about to engage in warfare there with the Centurions. So this allows you to set particular characters either... Uh, generally, you use it to refuse people like your dynasty members or heir, say, from being automatically selected as a as a knight or centurion in this case. And then we have the Legacy Weapons mod, which we actually can't do anything yet, but we you might have seen the decision for forging Legacy, Legacy Sword. I've also played with this mod before. I actually believe it was in the City of Wonders playthrough as well. So we've got a lot going on here that we have not yet been able to see and that we're not going to be able to see for actually quite a long, long time. Lots of graphical things going on here as well. The brighter portraits, of course, the liberal use of the barbershop throughout this one to get a real good look at our character and his many trials and tribulations there. We've got the incredible community flavor pack and the more recent ethnicities and portrait expanded to kind of overhaul the, the, the look of all the characters on the map there and the compatibility patch to allow those two to work together. Then we have UI changes like the extended outliner, which honestly I wouldn't play Crusader Kings through without. We have the kind of Crusader Kings 2 inspired frames for various tiers of nobles. Then a nice coat of paint for the rest of the world with things like Daddy Pika, Daddy Picker, uh, graphical map overhaul, uh, icons to pretty much all of our decisions with the exception of the modded ones, holding graphics, you name it, we've got it. So it, it, it's meant to be a, a kind of comprehensive 
series, given that, you know, we are going for Rome after all, so we're gonna, we're gonna cover most of the globe at that point. Oh, and how could I forget? Oh, the, the mod that blew me away the most during this, I actually had no experience with using it before, so being immediately thrown into that was, um, was, was, was pretty surprising. The super piece, that, that incredible thing that I've been asking for, for, for CK2 and CK3 forever, the ability to change war demands and, and try and aim for different things with different negotiations, you know, trading family members and marriages and gold and counties to try and try and in, in our case, of course, get that white piece so we didn't have to lose our title. Uh, what an incredible mod. I, I was genuinely blown away by that. I thought it would be a little rough around the edges, but that is so incredibly comprehensive. It's probably got a permanent place in all of my Crusader Kings 3 playthroughs for the future, but we will leave it there. Next episode will be slightly longer. Obviously more gameplay, less introduction, less outro here while we talk about the mods and stuff. So Stay tuned for that. Maybe not every day, but we'll try and get one as with, with schedule permitting, basically.